So we've been, uh, we're on the seventh picture, seventh picture of the ten ox herding pictures. And the ox herding pictures are a way of uh, depicting our spiritual journey, the journey towards enlightenment. And in a way, the process, as we've uncovered it, uh, the whole process is enlightenment. Because we are already enlightened before we start the journey. All we have to do is remove the clouds. The clouds of our delusions, our passions, our desires, all the things we attach to. So in the last ox herding picture, number six, we were comfortably riding the ox, no longer trying to catch it. We just rode it. Our life gets easier, and practice is no longer a struggle. In this, the seventh picture, the ox is actually forgotten. We've merged with the ox. He's not even in the picture. But the self still remains. So forgetting the ox also means to forget any experience which you might have labeled as a kind of enlightenment experience. Any experience you might have had of oneness, any deep insight, not holding on. As long as you're holding on to those myriad experiences that we have in our sitting practice, we're stuck. It's an infamous sticking place for students to hold on. So now our life is more, very simply, an experience of oneness. We're always conscious of our interconnection. Always conscious of it. And we act from being interconnected. So we care about things. We care about others. We care about the grass and the trees. We care about the bugs and the snakes. We care about our families, our kids, our grandkids, our parents, each other. We care about each other. The whole shebang we experience as one. So the poems that go with this stage, this picture, are helpful. <laughs> the Dharma is not dual. The ox just points to our subject. As rabbit and snare differ in name, so Fish and net are not the same. As gold comes forth from dross, so the moon emerges from the clouds. A shaft of its icy light, ancient even in the age of Ion. In the verse, astride your ox, you've reached the hills of home with ox put away, you too are at ease. The sun's risen three poles high, yet you're still dreaming. Your whip and line hang idle under the thatched eaves. And the waka, hard to take people who fret over good and bad knowing nothing of Naniwa reads. So just taking a few of these lines for deeper understanding. The Dharma is not dual. The ox just points to our subject. 
there is no ox and you any longer. There is just this. This. Just this. Just this moment and everything is included. Ox is gone. We almost hardly remember him. It's gotten so much easier. Practice is really hard in the beginning. And thank goodness we have that aspiration that keeps us going. This is hard, it's discouraging. We have glimpses and then we have nothing for what feels like forever. But at this stage, practice is easy. Enlightenment is gone, worrying about it. The search for the ox, the discipline, the perseverance, the effort are finally rewarded by the ability to let go of the search and to just be present. It's almost ironic that this is it, because it's nothing special. <laughs> You're just happy. You're at ease. And we mostly do not attach to things. You might be rich or poor or any of the levels in between, but you're okay with wherever you have landed. You come forth with confidence. You feel good. It's just being present. As rabbit and snare differ in name, so fish and net are not the same. Just as it took the whip and the tether to catch the ox in stages two through five, I guess, it takes a snare to catch a rabbit and a net to catch a fish. But once caught, the snare and the net are no longer needed and can be discarded or set aside. In the same way, once you see you are your own Buddha nature, you no longer need the ox. There's nothing between you and your Buddha nature. You manifest it with every instant of your life. You no longer need the discipline. You no longer need the whip. There is a risk here, though, of letting go of practice in the forms that supported your quest. It's actually easy to drift backwards. <laughs> so though you may no longer need the same degree of discipline applied to your practice, you still need to practice. You still need to sit. You still need to be mindful. Sitting Zazen is coming home to yourself. It's pleasurable. You feel happy to get to your cushion. You feel you sit with a sense of delight at having a cushion and time to sit. Even though you had to really work hard to make that time, you did it. And it's satisfying to sit. And you also sit with a sense that this is just what you do. This is who you are. As gold comes forth from dross, so the moon emerges from the clouds. You realize that your Buddha nature has been here all along. It really is nothing special. It's just no longer obscured by your desires, your aggression, and all your other passions and the thoughts that accompany the passions and the desires. You see through your own storylines. You function freely in your world. You have emerged from the clouds. A shaft of icy light 
ancient even in the age of Ion. The light of this moon is clear and bright and icy. The moon is compassionate and its wisdom is dispassionate. That's the ice, seeing clearly, cutting through. There was once a Buddha king, a Buddha named King Ion, the most ancient of all the Buddhas to have appeared in our world. So ancient that already in the age of Ion means that the light of our Buddha nature has been there, been here, since before the dawn of time. Our Buddha nature has been here since the beginning of the first kalpa, billions of years ago. That light shines through all the kalpas of the past and into all the kalpas of the future. You remember what a kalpa is? An age. An age, yeah. I think uh, Kozan defined it in his talk recently as the time it takes for an eagle brushing its wing against the tip of a mountain to wear the mountain down to nothing. It's a lovely image, isn't it? Of course, now the Himalayas are sinking. <laughs> I wonder how many kalpas it will take to flatten them. So that light of our Buddha nature has been here forever, forever. Astride your ox, you've reached the hills of home. A sense of coming home pervades. A place where you can relax and be yourself. Nothing to prove, nothing to lose. I distinctly remember having this feeling of coming home when I was a student, I'd enter the Zendo and I would immediately feel I was home. It was strange because I had, didn't have any language for it except that I feel like I'm at home. This is my home. This is why I come. This is why I sit. I'm at home here. You put the ox out to pasture. <clears throat> Life is just as it is. You are okay with it, even when it's hard. You're not afraid, not even of death. You just accept that loss is part of our life. It doesn't make it easy, but it is our life. The important part is to remain unattached. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, but if you are rich and you fear losing your money, or you fear being taken advantage of, you cannot really reach this stage. You can't hold on to it. If you're poor, but you obsess about making money, about having money, if you have a poverty mentality that is all about poor me, I have no money, poor me, I have no power, you cannot reach this stage. To function freely requires no grasping. There's nothing to hold on to, nothing to grasp for. Similarly, if you fret over good and bad, constantly judging yourself and others, you remain stuck in dualism. Naniwa weeds in Japan are called ashi in one place, and yoshi in another. Ashi can also mean bad, and yoshi can also mean good. But it's just a plant growing wild that we've labeled. Calling it good or bad requires a judgment. And the moment you judge, you separate. And you move back into that dualistic world. 
Can you see the plant without words and hear how it preaches the Dharma? 